Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasting. On June 16, 1990, 52-year-old Trevelyn Evans put a sign on the door of her antique shop saying, Be back in two minutes. The Clangothlin Wales resident popped over to a nearby store and bought an apple and a banana and then disappeared. There were sightings of a woman matching her description around town at different points that afternoon and evening, including one that said she was speaking to a well-dressed man. But Trevelyne never went back to reopen her store. As the investigation to Trevelyne Evans' disappearance got underway, it turned out that this unassuming mom and antique lover had some secrets. For over 30 years, police have been trying to figure out if Trevelyne's disappearance was related to what was actually happening in her personal life, or if it was because of a killer who happened to be nearby. Strange messages that have popped up in recent years indicate that there is a great deal in the Trevelyne Evans case that lies just below the surface. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today... I want to tell you the story of Trevelyn Evans. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us once again. I am Kona. And I am Ethan. And we are the husband and wife team behind this podcast. Each week, I tell you the story of an unsolved missing persons case. Ethan doesn't know anything about this case going into the episode, and he is here to provide his reactions and questions in real time, hopefully asking some of the ones that you have at home. So we're heading back across the pond this week. Wales this time. Yes, our first case in Wales. Even though we haven't covered anyone from here, there is a possible connection to another case that we did cover last season. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so obviously we'll get into that. And I would also like to say that I've tried to look up the pronunciation of the Welsh towns and words, (laughs) (laughs) but I'm terrible with things like this. I'm not, it does not come naturally to me. But please know that I tried. And if it sounds terrible, I'm sorry. I'm American. I have a bad American accent. I'm usually pretty good with accents, but not Welsh. I cannot do... It's wild. Yeah. I can't I can't get there. Yeah. Just, you know, a little disclaimer up front, but I am trying. But now, without further ado, let's get into the case of Trevelyn Evans. Trevelyn Davis was born on September 6th, 1937 in Wales. She grew up in Clangothlin and spent her entire life there. Now, I've noticed in a lot of cases where the missing person is of the age that they have a family of their own, that there often isn't much information available about the family that they grew up with. So I don't know the name of Trevelyne's parents uh, or really anything about her childhood. You said she was born in the 30s too, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like 37. Yeah. Not a lot of information would be available yeah. Concerning and, that. And it's just one of those things where like, you know, after she went missing, because she was 52 when she went missing, you know, there weren't stories that were done about her that were like, let's discuss her childhood, you know, Nobody, right. they yeah. were just kind of focused on her life at the time. So that's really all I know. You know, what I do know is that she did have two brothers, Philip and Leonard, and they have shown up in various news articles over the years, of course, you know, making pleas for information on finding their sister. At some point, it it sounds like in her 20s, she met and married Richard Evans, and the couple had one son also named Richard. By 1990, Richard was married with children himself, and Trevelyn was a doting grandmother. Trevelyn had also always loved antiques, especially vintage furniture, 
And in 1989, she fulfilled a dream and opened her own antique shop on Church Street in her hometown, which she called Attic Antiques. Very cool. I mean, it was because she was like in her early 50s when she did this. And apparently it had been a dream of her for a, a dream of hers for quite some time. So Treveline was well known and well liked around town and her shop instantly became successful. Even though she had just embarked on this journey, her husband Richard was eyeing retirement. In 1990, the couple purchased a bungalow in the nearby coastal town of Ruthlin that they were renovating. In early June 1990, Treveline and Richard drove to the bungalow to start doing some work. They stayed there for the week, at least that was the plan. So the plan was to spend a week there doing the work, but Treveline only stayed for about three days because she had to get back to town to open up the shop. So basically, she took the car, she went back to town, and Richard stayed and worked on the bungalow. Saturday, June 16th was a busy day in Clingothlin, which is a bustling tourist town. Before opening up shop as usual around 9.30 that morning, Trevelyn went into the general store nearby and bought a pint of milk. Basically, it sounds like she had a coffee machine at work, so she's just buying milk for her coffee. The shopkeeper said that when Trevelyn reached into her purse to pay the 32 pence for the milk, that she took out a thick roll of bills in order to get the coins. It struck the shop keeper as an unusual amount of money for traveling to have in cash just on a random Saturday morning. Over the next couple of hours, about 25 people came in and out of Attic Antiques. Several of those visitors were friends and acquaintances, and they later reported that traveling was her usual, happy, relaxed self. Shortly after opening, one of her close friends stopped in and had a cup of coffee with her. The pair made plans to go to another friend's party that evening. Now, Treveline ran the shop on her own, so if she ever had to leave to like go grab a bite to eat or supplies for the store, she would put a note on the door and lock up. At around 12.40 p.m. that day, she did exactly that, placing a handwritten sign on the door that said, be back in two minutes. Treveline would also place some items for sale on the sidewalk outside of the store, uh, and she did that on this day as well. While she was gone, several customers came and bought items, slipping the money inside of the mail slot on the door. That's very trusting. I know, like it's so small town, right? Which I find I love, even though this is like a tourist spot, it sounds like. Yeah. It's still such a small town that like she just trusts people to put money through the mail slot. And right. they do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that she didn't put anything out of great value, but Right, still. right. I'm sure it's just like, yeah, little trinkets or old books or whatever. But yeah, I found that kind of cute. So people who came by and saw the sign that afternoon assumed that Trevelyn had run out to get lunch. In fact, she was spotted about 20 minutes later buying an apple and a banana on nearby High Street. 20 minutes, not two minutes. 20, Yeah. She was also seen crossing Castle Street. So these are all, again, just downtown streets, you know, nearby. Like you said, 20 minutes, right? So I already find this timeline interesting. And I think it's reasonable to assume that when she left the note saying she would be back in two minutes, that she did not mean literally sure. two minutes. Yeah. Though it has been said that on busy Saturdays, Trevelyne didn't like to leave the shop at all if she could help it. Well, yeah, that's revenue. Exactly. And yeah, I'm sure she's making a couple bucks here and there with the stuff she's selling on the sidewalk. But like, yeah, I mean, if she had 25 people come in and already that morning, you know, it was it's that a busy to me. Day. Yeah, that yeah. to me sounds like a busy day. For sure. So that it's weird that she would have left it all. Right. But yeah, what was she doing for the 20 minutes before she was seen buying the apple and banana? Even stranger is the fact that there was another confirmed sighting of her on Market Street near her home at around 2.30, nearly two hours after she put that sign on the door. Mm. Now, she wasn't seen going in or coming out of her home, just kind of walking by it on that street. And she was seen walking in the direction of her shop. Okay. But two hours. Two hours, which... I mean, it doesn't seem like even on a slow day, she would just leave the store for that long, you know? So there were further sightings of her, though those were unconfirmed. 
And these sightings were of her walking away from town. So what it sounds like is you've got, you know, like Church Street and like the High Street, these streets I talked about, which are kind of in the town square, right, by her by her store. But there's also a larger road, the A5, which goes downtown as well and then leads out of town. So she was seen walking along the A5 or I shouldn't say this because like I said, these are unconfirmed, unconfirmed. Somebody matching her description was seen walking along the A5 heading out of town. But Why would she walk out of town if she has her car? Well, yeah, exactly. Her car was at the shop. Like she had driven her car from home to work that morning and parked it about 30 yards away from her store. So she's wandering around town. We have these sightings of her wandering around town. Right. And then we have an unconfirmed sighting of her walking on, I don't want to say a highway, but a busier street. Yeah. Leading out of town. Right. And so buying the apple and the banana were confirmed. The 230 sighting by her house was confirmed. Then there's an unconfirmed sighting at 235 um, where she's like walking on the A5 in the opposite direction of her store. And then another unconfirmed sighting at 345, again, walking on the A5 toward the D River. At around 6 p.m., another resident reported driving by the store and seeing what she described as a suspicious looking man standing outside. She also said that the door of the shop appeared to be open. Mm. Police are not certain whether or not Trevelyne ever went back to the shop that afternoon after she put the sign in the window. There was a banana peel found in one of the trash cans, but they weren't sure if that was from the banana she had purchased that afternoon or if it was there beforehand. Either way, the sign did remain up the entire day, and Trevelyne's car remained in that parking space just 30 yards from the office or from the store. So that night, Richard called his wife to check in, but she didn't answer the home phone. He called the store and still got nothing. Now, we don't have details on these calls, like call logs or, you know, any of those fun things that we have in newer cases sometimes. Right. What I do have is, you know, it's just that it's been said that he called several times and it was in the evening. So I don't know a time or, you know, how many times is several or how long he waited between calls or or any of that information. You know, I would have to imagine that if you're taking it at face value, that when he initially called, he assumed that she was maybe out to dinner or, you know, just doing something. But when the hour became late and he still couldn't get in touch with her, he became worried. So like I said, he called several times, couldn't get in touch with her. Then he started to freak out a little bit. And so after being unable to reach his wife, he allegedly became so concerned that he called a neighbor and asked them to go to their house and check on her. So the neighbor went there and was like, no, she's not home. And then he asked if I and I'm not clear if he asked the same neighbor or if he called somebody else, but he asked somebody to go to the store, to the antique store and see if she was there. So somebody went there to check and the antique store was still closed. The sign was still in the window. She was not there. Richard ended up calling the police at about 11 p.m. that night to report his wife missing. So we're talking 11 hours? Because you said she left the store around... 1240. 1240. So yeah, roughly 11 hours. Right. At some point prior to Richard calling the police at 11, it does sound as though members of Trevelyne's family went into the shop, which was locked. So, again, that's why I'm not sure, like, who, if, if it was, like, he called his son and said, hey, go check on the store, see if your mom's there, or who it was. Because, like I said, it only said just members of the family. Yeah. But in any case, they went in the evening at some point. They went to the store. It was locked, which is important because, you know, that one witness said that she thought that the door had been open at right. around six when yeah. she drove by. And inside, everything, you know, was in order. It's not like there were signs of a struggle or anything like that. In fact, it was quite the opposite. So they went to the counter and Trevelyne's makeup compact was open and sitting on the counter along with her jackets, as well as some flowers and fruit that she had been planning on taking home that evening. 
They also found her handbag, which had all of her credit cards and I believe her ID and, you know, just everything you would expect to see. Um, Nothing seemed to be missing. But there was no mention of the large amount of cash that the shop owner had said that she had seen that morning. Mm. The investigation into Trevelyne's disappearance kicked into high gear the next morning with everyone in town concerned about what could have happened to their beloved neighbor. Police knocked on every single residence in the small town. And during these interviews, some interesting information emerged about men who had been seen hanging around in the days leading up to Trevelyne's disappearance. On Thursday, June 14th, Trevelyne was seen speaking to two men outside of her shop. One appeared to be in his 30s and was dressed smartly in a suit with the sleeves rolled up and appeared to have gelled hair. Now, keep in mind, this is 1990. So like the whole like skinny tie, like suit, Miami Vice kind of like suit sleeves rolled up was very much in style. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's not what I I was picturing, but okay. (laughs) What are you picturing? I don't know, something a little bit more modern, like like the shirt sleeves rolled up? No, 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 like straight like up the suit jacket. Suit. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. The second person who was seen was an older man around 65, dressed in an aquamarine sweater with a tie underneath, a paisley tie, apparently. So yeah, one of those like, you know, dress shirt, tie, sweater, v-neck sweater, over the top kind of situations. And then the next day, so this was Thursday, June 14th, she got back into town on the 13th, opened the store on the 14th. Then on the next day, the 15th, she was seen with someone who may have been the same older man from Thursday. This time he was dressed more formally in a navy blue suit and was carrying a black briefcase in his left hand. On an episode of the popular UK news magazine show Crime Watch, it was said that new information also placed the man in a wine bar in town that Friday evening. Now, it was said that Trevelyne was with him at this wine bar Friday night, but this sighting wasn't from somebody who knew Trevelyne. It was from some Scottish tourists who were in town, who, you know, after traveling went missing and they're asking everybody and her na- her face is everywhere. They're like, oh yeah, we saw her with this guy at this wine bar on Friday. But like, that's only... That doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were together. Like this is... Or that, or that it was traveling because it's not somebody who knew right, her. Right. Yeah. So it could have just been another middle-aged lady who was there. But... This does also appear to be the same man that the witness reported seeing in front of Trevelyne's shop around 6 p.m. on the evening of her disappearance. Detective Superintendent John Cook appeared on the episode of Crime Watch and had something very interesting to say at the end. This episode actually aired on Trevelyne's 53rd birthday about three months after her disappearance. One of the theories that have been floating around is that the large amount of cash she was carrying around with her and the man she was seen talking to could have meant that she had decided to go off voluntarily. So basically that she's having an affair with this guy. That's why he was hanging around. She took out a bunch of cash and she was just going to leave town. I mean, she's also a shop owner, an antique shop owner. So especially in the 90s, like a lot of shops like that would have operated on cash basis. So, I mean, it's not out of the realm of possibilities that either this person, this individual, the older guy bought something that was expensive and paid cash. Yeah. And that's why she had, that's why she was seen with him multiple times. And that's why she had a large sum of cash on her. Right. Or conversely, He could have been an antiques dealer and she could have been buying something from him. Right. And she had a sign in her store window that said, I'll buy anything. Uh, So, yeah, that has that's another theory is that these guys who were seen around the shop or whatever and who she was talking to were kind of red herrings. Right. In that they were just, you know, clients or customers of hers. Yeah. But yes. So, of course, one of the theories, like I said, she was having an affair. She ran off. But Trevelyne's family was adamant that she never would have done that. 
D.S. Cook apparently agreed, saying this. I think it's most important to stress that this is a murder inquiry. We're aware that Mrs. Evans had a wide circle of friends, both male and female, and we urge them to ring us here and contact us, and we treat whatever they say with the utmost discretion. So three months in, they were calling this a murder inquiry. They've abandoned that theory that she was having an affair and ran off. Yeah, fairly early on, from what it seems like. And I also thought the mention of both male and female friends and discretion that was, was in- interesting. Yeah, for sure. Because what police probably already knew, but the public wouldn't find out for years, was that Treveline's personal life was seemingly not as it appeared. At the time of her disappearance, Treveline's 30-year marriage was portrayed as being extremely happy. After all, they had just bought that vacation home. She had her business. Their son was happy and healthy with a family of his own. Everything seemed perfect. But, of course, looks can be deceiving. It was rumored that Treveline had been having affairs over the years. Now, this could have been idle small-town gossip, but she did apparently inherit 10,000 pounds from one of her lovers when he passed away. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And this inheritance, I think, happened not too long before her disappearance. About a year prior to this recording, Channel 4 aired a show called In the Footsteps of Killers that took an in-depth look into Treveline's case and talked about all of the possible suspects, including her husband, Richard. While the husband is, of course, always a suspect, initially, it seemed unlikely that Richard could have had anything to do with his wife's disappearance. Yeah, didn't she take the car and leave him at the cottage without a vehicle? Exactly. He was in Rithlin, about 40 miles away at the time, with witness accounts backing this up. Right. And this is before the, the days of Uber and exactly Lyft. Yeah. And, you know, probably uh, he could have called a taxi, but. Yeah, this was a really high profile case. And so you would think a random taxi driver would remember making this weird 40 mile drive and would have said something. But nobody ever came forward and said, oh, yeah, I picked that guy up or whatever. But it's also a small town. So if he had been in back in town, I mean, we we have eyewitnesses seeing her all over yeah. the town. Somebody probably would have seen him, too. Right. Because according to the 2023 documentary, he was spotted back in Klingothlin on June 16th, the day she disappeared. According to criminologist David Wilson, who co-hosted In the Footsteps of Killers with Amelia Fox, quote, There's also opportunity, because I've discovered from my police contacts that he was back earlier in Klingothlin than we have previously believed. He was seen in the pub at 2.30 p.m. shortly before Treveline's last reported sighting, end quote. And, you know, I would like to point out that in everything that I've read, up until 2023 and this documentary coming out, nothing ever mentioned Richard being in town. It was only this documentary that was released last year. So do we know where they got this information or was it ever? Well, yeah, he said from my police contacts. I mean, yeah. So, yeah, what you gotta, does that mean? I, you've got to take it with a grain of salt, but it is certainly interesting if true, obviously. No, for sure. But it does seem odd that it wouldn't have come out previously. To, yeah, but, to that. but I can see police wanting to keep that close to the vest. We'll talk a little bit more about Richard, too. So anyway, you know, back to the initial investigation, though. Despite interviewing literally everybody in town, checking 1,500 names and eliminating about 700 cars from the inquiry, police unearthed few clues. There were also searches of the River Dee, the canal, mine shafts and caves in the area, but no trace of traveling was found and her case soon went cold. And this was the largest search in Welsh history at the time. Investigators apparently continue to suspect Richard, though, again, in a- absence of anything else. Well, sure. You have to. Yeah. And in 2001, the case was reopened. So, you know, 10, 11 years later, the hope was that new eyes and forensic advancements could help the case. Police, during this reopening, actually arrested Richard. 
But after interviewing him, he was released with no charges. So we talked about this in the Claudia Lawrence case where it's very different from America. Like, right. typically, if you're arrested in a murder case, it is with the intention of they are taking you to trial. Yes. Like, right. They've already built the case. Yeah. Like this. Yeah. You confess like whatever. This is great. But if you're arrested, you're probably going to go to jail and go to trial and and all of that. Whereas over in the UK, it sounds as though they will arrest people in order to interrogate them without necessarily planning on bringing charges. Right. So he was arrested. But again, charges were never filed against him. The years continued to pass, and Trevelyan's case was periodically reopened, but with no new news. In 2011, over 20 years after she was last seen, police believed that a local serial killer, Robin Lingus, could have been involved. Lingus had been convicted of killing three men, one of whom was an antiques dealer. These murders occurred only 30 miles from Trevelyan's home, But they were four years after her disappearance, and they all kind of happened in a six-month period when, like, he was uh, on drugs, from what it sounds like. And they were men. Yeah, they were men, but one was an antiques dealer. I mean, so what? And so I guess, like, the thought was maybe Trevelyan was first, and then he killed people later. But, I mean, it was pretty thin, honestly. And so It's good. Good in theory. Yeah. I mean, you got to look at it. I think if you've got a serial killer operating in the area, you obviously have to to look at that and run that lead down. But they did. And they eventually said that there wasn't a connection. In 2021, another serial killer was brought into the mix, Christopher Hollowell. Now, if you've been listening to our show for a while, that name may sound familiar to you. That's because he was also suspected of being involved in Claudia Lawrence's disappearance, which we covered last season. Hollowell, who has been convicted of two murders, is suspected of having committed many more. He was also apparently working in North Wales as a window fitter at the time of Trevelyne's disappearance. And he actually began his criminal career in the 80s by scoping out houses as he was cleaning their windows and looking for antiques to steal. Hmm. Yeah, so the the story with Hollowell, basically, is that he was convicted of killing two women, but they found trophies, basically, that could belong to upwards of 60 women. Wow. Yeah. So he suspected in a lot of unsolved cases in the area, including Claudia Lawrence's. Now, the two women Hollowell was convicted of killing were much younger than 52-year-old Trevelyne. I think they were both in their 20s. But investigative reporter Tim Hicks thinks that this could still fit, saying, quote, Trevelyne had a resemblance to his mother. Hollowell's ex-wife said whenever he mentioned his mother or saw somebody that looked like his mother, he became absolutely enraged, end quote. Now, this theory also seems a little bit loose. But a witness who had lived in Klingothlin his entire life did come forward and say that he saw a strange man with big eyes walking on Market Street the night before Trevelyne went missing. This man apparently fits the description of Christopher Hollowell, who does have big creepy eyes. And then the next morning, the 15th, the man saw him again and he said, quote, I was going up the horseshoe pass at about 7.45-ish. There was a camper van parked on the verge, and as I approached it, the same man I saw on Friday night came out of the camper van. It was definitely the same guy as I had seen on Friday night. He had the same clothes on, and I thought it was very odd where he was parked, because on the opposite side, there was a lay-by where he could have pulled in, but he was actually on the grass verge looking at the scenery." End quote. The man says that he saw the van again that afternoon around 1230, parked at the Quick Save supermarket, which is about two minutes from the antique store. So, I mean, this is pretty compelling, though, because apparently a man matching Christopher Hollowell's description was seen not only in the days leading up to Trevelyne's disappearance, but two minutes away, 10 minutes before she left her antique 
shop on the afternoon of her disappearance. Right. With a van. Yeah, I mean, this is assuming that that is the serial killer. Sure. Yeah, let's just assume that it is, right? Like, let's assume that, yes, Christopher Hollowell was in town, had a van, was right by the shop. Trevling looked like his mom. He hated his mom. Whatever. Even if all of that is true, then how do you explain the sightings of her later right. that afternoon? Right. I feel like if she had been abducted by a serial killer, it's going to be a fast operation. It's not, I see you at 1240 as you're buying fruit and then have you inexplicably walk around for a few hours before never being seen again. Right. Yeah, that timeline doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. I mean, it, it makes sense if she left at 1240, bought the fruit, and then was never seen again. Right. right? Yeah. Because then, yeah, that does sound like she was just snatched up by anybody, you know? Yeah, and even if, let's say, that was the first time he laid eyes on her and then he was strategizing about how to kidnap slash kill her or whatever, yeah. why was she still wandering around town for several hours? When she should have been, been in her store. Right, exactly. Yes, that's the So that the still part. doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't make any sense. So it really does seem as though Trevelyan had more going on that day. I don't know what more is, but it does not seem as though it was a typical day in Trevelyne's life. No one who saw her on that afternoon of June 16th said that she looked like she was in distress or anything like that. She was just walking around town and no one would have given it a second thought had she not gone missing. Right. So what was she doing? Why would she leave her store on a busy Saturday to go walk around for a few hours? While they were making the documentary I referenced earlier, the filmmakers found a woman named Linda. Now, Linda worked at a nearby pub and actually had a relationship with Trevelyne's brother, Philip. Linda and Philip met two days after Trevelyne's disappearance, and they were together for five years. She had a lot to say. So what I'm guessing, because... From what I understand, Philip didn't live around there. I'm guessing he came into town because of Trevelyne's disappearance and then happened to go into the pub, which is why, like, Linda had never met him before. Mm. So they met two days after her disappearance. So she spoke to the documentarians and, you know, different reporters, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, you've got to take this with a grain of salt, too, because this is all coming from one woman. We don't know anything about her. And, you know, she seemingly did not know Trevelyne personally. And a lot of what she had to say is based on things she claims Philip told her during the course of their relationship. According to Linda, Richard did apparently come into her pub, so she did know him. And I don't know if she knew him before Trevelyne went missing or only got to know him after, but she talks about him coming in after. And according to Linda, unlike his wife, Richard was not well-liked around town, and Trevelyne was very unhappy in her marriage. She also said some things about how Richard didn't seem like he was truly grieving his wife when he would come into the pub and like talk about her, but I don't put a lot of stock no. in people's perceptions of other people's grief. Yeah. You know, especially when you come to British people, because like, let's be, I mean, who knows, right? <laughs> like. You may have just offended some of our listeners, but sure. No, you know, stiff upper lip and all that. However, she did have this to say about one night when Philip came in. Quote, Phil came in one night and said there were carpets coming out of the house and a couple of bits of furniture. If he's waiting for her to come home, she's not going to be happy, is she, that her furniture is going out of the house and, and the carpets? End quote. Where is this conversation in the timeline? Do we know? See, I don't know exactly, but seemingly pretty close to Trevelyne's disappearance. Because if this is years later, then, you know, it would have seemed weird, right? Right. So I don't know if it was days or weeks or months later, but it was close enough that it seemed strange. Oh, and remember the well-dressed man mm -hmm. who um, police were looking for? According to Linda, that was actually Philip. Hmm. She said that Philip was working in Hungary at the time, and that's why nobody recognized him. What? So he but had he been was in, in town. Right. But because he hadn't been in town for a long time because he was working in Hungary. And so when people saw him, they didn't realize it was her brother, Philip. 
They just thought it was a stranger, which like I get kind of, but Trevelyan's family grew up in Clangothlin. Right. So it seems weird that, I mean, maybe everybody who saw that man was like new in town, but it also would seem weird that if it were him that like Trevelyan's family would have been like, oh yeah, no, Philip was in town. That's probably who she was talking to. Or that Philip himself wouldn't have said, oh yeah, like yeah, I that was, was there. Me. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know, but. Again, I had to bring it up because this was just published and Linda said, oh, yeah, that was Philip. He had been working in Hungary. Either way, in 2001, when the case was first reopened and they arrested Richard and all of that, police did say that they no longer had faith in the accuracy of the sketch that they had made up of that man and had been distributed. So it did seem as though that line of inquiry may have been abandoned. So there could have been a situation in which they realized it was Philip or or whatever. And they're like, okay, well, that doesn't have anything to do with anything. Let's forget about it. Again, I just, I don't know. So if police didn't believe that she was having an affair and ran off and the serial killers, you know, probably it's weren't loose. involved. It's loose. Does that bring us back to Richard? I mean, unless he has some corroboration on an alibi. Other than him just being at the cottage without a car. Yeah. Well, there were witnesses who placed him there. But in 2019, a bizarre series of events brought this case right back to Rithlin, where Richard apparently was the day his wife vanished. So this part here is actually why I decided to do an episode on this case, because it is something I have not seen before. Okay. In 2019, two brothers, Andrew Sutton from Wrexham and Lee Sutton from Kimmel Bay, became interested in Treveline's case after coming across, quote, new circumstantial evidence that led them to believe that Treveline could potentially be in Rithlin specifically the Ruthlin Golf Club. All right. I'm interested. They're an alive. No. Oh, okay. Like buried. Okay. All right. It was never said what this new circumstantial evidence was, at least, you know, not publicly. Mm -hmm. The brothers apparently took this tip to the police, but, you know, police didn't respond quickly enough because it was a very old case. These are two just random dudes. And, you know, who knows what the circumstantial evidence was. So they decided to take the investigation into their own hands. They allegedly went to the golf club and used an underfloor inspection camera, which they say showed human remains. But before you ask, I have no idea what an underfloor inspection camera would be capable of seeing and how they would have gotten a hold of this or, or anything. I don't know what that means. Okay. But they apparently got some sort of x-ray camera that looked under floorboards and apparently found remains, which had to have been bones by then. Yeah. But so because so, at first so I was wait, thinking like where, an where infrared. Where is this again? Ruthlin, where the bungalow was, where Richard said he was. Right. But where in Ruthlin? At this golf club. So they found human remains under the floorboards of a golf club. Yes. You mean to tell me nobody would have smelled that? Yeah, I mean, obviously not at that point because well, there's nothing yes, to smell. But, but yes, I mean, 30 years ago. I, but see, that's the thing. I don't know if the golf club was even there 30 years ago. Maybe 30 years ago was a field and the golf club was new. Like, I, I don't know. Hmm. But yes, they said that they found remains under the floor of this golf club. I mean, are they still just putting planks of wood on dirt? <laughs> You know, like, <laughs> yeah. Listen, I feel I, I feel like building has advanced a little bit and it wouldn't be like floorboards right on a dirt surface. You know, they would have put like a foundation they would have dug down if it was a new building. Right. I don't and know. And if it was an existing building. Maybe they're saying she was moved there later. So the brothers went back to the police and told them what they had found. They're like, listen, we got our camera out. Like, our tip is for real. We saw a body with our camera. So the police are like, okay, like, we'll come check it out. 
And they came out a few days later and did their own search, but found nothing. Mm. The brothers were adamant about what they saw, however, and believe that somebody moved the body in the days between the two searches. And like they were so adamant about this that they filed a formal complaint against the police because they're like, they're mishandling this. Somebody moved the body. We saw this body. They screwed up this investigation. Seems a little far-fetched, but... Yeah, I don't know. So, like, this is obviously kind of strange, right? Yeah. But this is not what got me, because I feel like this is your run-of-the-mill, like, weird shit that just happens in these cases sometimes. But what got me is that two years later, in 2021, a metal plaque was drilled into a bench in Rithlin near the bungalow that said, quote, in memory of Treveline Evans... Vanished 16-6-1990. Found Rithlin GC 14-3-2019. Removed 19-3-2019. R.I.P. Well, that was probably one of the brothers. Well, yeah, but it, okay. A metal plaque engraved and drilled into a I'm bench. not saying it's not weird. But is insane. I, I I agree, but two years later, it was clearly one of the brothers. Okay, okay, that would have put that there. Sure. All right, but then a year later, a year later, a second plaque was placed on a bench in Prestaton, about five miles away, like like closer to the water, on a hillside next to a two hundred year old abandoned miner's cottage. It read, quote, justice awaits those responsible for the removal and disposal of Traveling Evans in this life or next from Rithlin Golf Club on March 19th, 2019 at noon. May the Lord have mercy upon their soul, end quote. Okay, so go back to these brothers, because I'm thinking that it that was also one of them. Who are these two? The, these, random. These are dudes. random guys yeah, that got one, that became obsessed with her disappearance I guess, for neither, this case. Neither one of them lived in Clangothlin or Rithlin. Uh huh. Um, one of them had moved somewhere else. Again, one was living in Wrexham, which was nearby. But like they were like professional guys. Like one of them was a carpenter. The other one worked for the county or or the city or or something like that. Like these were not just like weirdos like they were just normal guys I'm not, I'm not necessarily calling them weirdos but they clearly became i'd say overly interested in this case and let's give them the benefit of the doubt they saw something on whatever this below floorboard camera yeah. was and then they got pissed off that whatever it was that they saw wasn't what they saw still being obsessed with it put these plaques up because who else would have put those plaques up? I don't know, but the brothers both deny any knowledge of the plaques. But it was literally what they were alleging. It was. So, but like, if they're alleging it, and the plaques specifically refer to what they were alleging, who else would have put it up? It's not like... Well, okay, yes, yes. Apparently this has grown because there was apparently an all-night vigil at the site of the first plaque on Christmas 2021. So this theory of traveling being buried or like whatever, like has grown to the point where a vigil was held at the first bench for traveling. So, I mean, we're talking multiple people now who are like somehow interested in or involved in this. I, I, I don't know. I just... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know either. Both plaques have, have since been removed. They're both gone. But yeah, I, I don't know. Like the metal engraved plaques screwed into the benches are just so weird to me. Like what I can't get over is how they weren't notes sent to the police station or to a reporter or anything like that. Like somebody literally engraved metal plaques and attached them to park benches using hardware, like eight screws each. Perhaps a carpenter. <laughs> well, not a metal smith or whatever. 
I mean, yes, maybe it was the brothers, but I just, it's still a lot of effort to go through for two people who have no actual connection to Traveling or her family. Agreed, but I go back to them being the ones that were alleging this and like nobody else previous to the candlelight vigil was saying anything like this. We don't think, we don't know, because again, there's that like circumstantial evidence that led them there. So I don't know where that came from, what it was or or what's going on in that town. It, it just seems like a, either a red herring or, or theories of uh, true crime theorists. Yeah, I don't know. As we record this, it's January 2024, and unless you count the remains that may or may not have been underneath the golf club floorboards, no trace of Trevelyn Evans has been found in over 33 years. Though the cash she reportedly had with her on the morning of her disappearance was never found, her bank accounts have never been touched, and police began investigating her disappearance as a murder early on. Trevelyn was declared legally dead in 1997. Her husband, Richard, though apparently held under suspicion, has never been charged with any crime related to his missing wife. He was faced with another tragedy in 1999 when his and Trevelyn's only child, their son, Richard, died suddenly of a heart attack. He was only in his late 30s. Trevelyn's father and her brother, Philip, have both also passed away. Her other brother, Leo, spoke to many news outlets about his sister, but it's been years since I've found any quote for him, so he might have passed away as well. Her husband, Richard, passed away in late 2014. In 1992, Detective Chief Inspector Colin Edwards, who was heading the investigation at the time, said, quote, It is without doubt the strangest inquiry I have ever been involved with. How a happily married woman could vanish without trace on a sunny Saturday morning in a busy town center is totally baffling, end quote. I mean, just her wandering around town for hours is what's really throwing everything. Even if you go back to Richard being jealous or whatever, whatever, right? Yeah. And somehow managing to get from Ruthland back to Congolflin, I don't think that that explains her wandering around town for two hours. Right. And then if she was seen on the A5, where was she going? Why was right. she why was she wandering on foot when she has a vehicle? Right. So like that doesn't fit with her, you know, leaving town or whatever. Right. I mean, maybe you could say she was walking to meet up with somebody, but it's just Why? I mean, why? Like yeah, like why leave your shop which you loved, you know, and yeah, maybe you're having trouble in your marriage, but again, her only child was around. She had grandchildren whom she loved. Like, why, she, why would you abandon your only source of income too? Yeah. Like, so, I mean, it seems as though this antique store was relatively successful. Mm -hmm. Again, marriage falling apart, whatever. Like, why would you leave your only source of income? And, and it's a place that you love. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the only thing I can think of is maybe she was meeting up with somebody for some reason, but wasn't necessarily meeting up with them to like run away, was just meeting up with them for another reason. But even then, it's like, why do it in the middle of the day? Why not just do it in the evening when your shop is closed, right? right. Yeah. Like, even if you're planning on coming back, being gone from the shop that long is weird. So it's like, even if she was planning on meeting somebody for a short period of time and then something bad happened to her after that, it's still strange that she would just leave the shop at all. Yeah. The only other thing that I find weird about the story of the day of her disappearance is that she was planning on going to this party on that night. Right. And according to her friend who was interviewed by Crime Watch, she was like super excited about it. She, you know, really wanted to go. Depending on her relationship with Richard, again, we don't know their habits. We don't know their patterns. And this is before the days of cell phones. So he's out of town. I can see her not mentioning this to her husband, right? Sure. So, with, but whether she mentioned it or not, to me, it actually did seem a little weird that he would be so concerned about not getting in touch with her after only a couple of hours. Because I don't know, like I said, I don't know the exact timeline of the calls, but let's say the shop closed at, she closed up at six or something like that, right? Then 
you would think that she wouldn't necessarily be going straight home. Maybe she would be visiting with people. Maybe she would be doing other things. And what I kept on thinking about is, you know, I've never been to Wales, but I've been to Europe. I've been to the area. And this is summertime. It does not get dark there forever. Right. Right. Like it doesn't get dark till like 10, 11 p.m. And people stay out and people eat dinner late. Yeah. So to me, even if it's just a normal day, she works all day, she closes up the shop, even if Richard didn't know she was going to a party, which indicates even later, I think it would be reasonable to assume maybe she would have gone out to dinner or something like that. I could see somebody not getting, not even getting home from just a normal dinner till like 10 p.m. or something. Right. But we also don't know the timeline of these phone calls that he made, right? Because he... Right. All we know is that he called the police around 11. And to me, because, you know, some people said that that's suspicious because they're like, oh, you know... It was quick. No, they say it's suspicious because she was last seen in the afternoon and she wasn't reported missing until 11. But to me, it seems too quick. Like, it seems too quick to have somebody backing up. He only called the police after he had people go and check on her at home and at the shop. Uh And to me, that's way too early. If we're talking nine, 10 o'clock and you're having people go in and check on her, like that's a reasonable time for somebody to still be out. Right. But in Wales in the summer. Sure. But we also don't know the nature of their relationship. And maybe that was unusual behavior on her part being completely out of contact. Yeah, it, it very well could be. And but even though these are not cell phones and this is the 90s, assuming that the police actually did their job, they could have very easily corroborated the phone calls, answered or otherwise, answered or not, made from the cottage to home and made from the cottage to the, the store. The store, Right, but my issue with that is... You know, okay, let's say he started calling her at like seven, eight o'clock. Well, sure. I know that that leaves plenty of time for him to get into town and get back out. Yes. Yeah. Sure. So that doesn't, even if all of that checks out, that doesn't mean much to me. Mm. I don't know. I just, that bugged me as I was reading it. The fact that Europeans tend to eat dinner late, it's daylight for a long ass time that time of year. Like, I just don't understand why he was so concerned because she wasn't an old lady who, like, needed to be checked on, you know? She was somebody who a friend popped by to have coffee that morning and was like, hey, want to come to a party? And she's like, yeah, awesome. Let's go. You know, like, she... Right, but so he didn't... He may not have known about the party. Pro- probably didn't. Yeah. If it was an invite that same day. And I go back to, we don't know the nature of their relationship and whether that was abnormal behavior on her part to not be home, to not call him, that sort of thing. No, for sure. But on the other hand, they've been married for 30 years. She's lived in this town all of her life. She's apparently known this friend forever. So I feel like the friend would have an idea of whether or not this was normal, right? Like the friend, you know, like let's say the friend comes in, has coffee, is like, hey, want to come to this party? And she's like, yeah, let's go. When the friends interviewed on Crime Watch three months later, I would feel she'd be like, yeah, it was really weird. You know, she said she'd come to this party and she never goes to this party because Richard doesn't let her go out or like she never goes out. She always goes straight home after work. So I was surprised. Like there was nothing like that. There was nothing that anybody said that indicated that her going out wasn't something that she would normally do. Except that ex- except during the day to leave the shop. Which yes. Was no, abnormal. that part. That was across the board abnormal but the going out at night after work was apparently not abnormal and again we don't know we're looking at this from thousands of miles away decades later and these are people we do not know that that timeline of richard's calls just it bothers me you can understand why 33 years later like this case hasn't been solved Though many of those who knew and loved Trevelyn Evans are no longer able to get answers, the mystery of her disappearance endures, forever shaping the small town in North Wales, where there are still many people who continue to try to solve the mystery of Trevelyn Evans.
Trevelyan Evans has been missing from Clangothlin, Debingshire, Wales since June 16, 1993. She was 52 at the time of her disappearance. She would be 86 today. Anyone with information regarding Trevelyan Evans is asked to contact UK Crime Stoppers at 0800 555 111. They also have an anonymous tip form available on their website. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social, and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and TikTok. Please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research writing and editing is done by me, Kona Gallagher. The music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!